Hello and welcome to part 7 of my Dividing Head series. It is beginning to come along quite nicely and I am reasonably happy with progress so far. If you haven't seen how we got to this stage, please do have a look at the playlist over on my channel for parts 1 to 6. If you are going to stick around today, it is time to start looking at what Thomas calls the simple indexing attachment. That is the part that allows division using plates through the worm and wheel. The first part to consider is the cast iron main block. This will act as a bearing for the worm spindle, carry the division plates, and it will be the attachment point to the head where it will take the place of the plunger here. Now this casting is not well aligned with both halves being offset by some considerable margin. It is these surfaces that will remain unmachined, so the first thing I will do is try and make the best of what I have with some file work. All I'm trying to do here is to remove the offset between the two halves of the casting, along with any other defects that might have made it through the casting process. To be honest, with the amount of material that I'm removing here, there is unlikely to be any of that cast surface left at all. The two cast sides are not parallel, and so I have chosen one that looks the nearest to square, and I am using that one to occasionally check that I am not drifting too far from the original shape. Having made a start on cleaning this up, I'm inclined to think it would be both easier and faster to fabricate this from two pieces of bar stock, but in the spirit of the project, I will persevere with the cast part as supplied. Once I have the worst of that offset removed and the transition to the circular section cleaned up, it is over to the mill to form some reference surfaces. Firstly, I am taking a cut off the bottom of the round section. I have the file section resting on the vice base here, but this has been set up by eye as much as anything, and I'm paying attention to how the depth of cut changes as I traverse the surface, to make sure I am not miles off. With a flat surface here, I can flip this over and form a small surface on the other side as well. With two cast surfaces against the vice jaws, I am aware that this is really not a good setup, but I'm not looking to clean up the whole side, just form an area that I can reference. Next is a quick skim off my preferred edge. Again, I have just set this by eye to take an even cut off the whole surface. I can then flip the part in the vise to form a parallel surface on the other side. It is worth pointing out that none of those operations were to any dimensions, but I now have four reference surfaces that are at 90 degrees and parallel to each other. The external surface of this lozenge shape is the only surface that will remain as cast, or at least as filed. There are to be two bores through this side, here and here, and for aesthetic purposes I would like them to fall centrally in this section. I will roughly lay out the part with that assumption just to make sure that I have enough material elsewhere. I have clamped the part to an angle plate using a square against the long edge, and after a little bit of maths, I am scribing the positions of the two holes so that they are centred on that feature. Marking the height then finally sets these hole locations. With that done, I can remount the part, and after picking up one of those scribe lines, I can calculate and scribe the position of the through bore. This could have been done in the first setup if I hadn't initially mounted the part backwards. I never sort of knew what I was doing. Off camera, I have centre punched and swept a circle with dividers there, and as I hope you can see, there is enough material to machine all of the surfaces I need. So it is over to the mill to machine those two bores. I am edge finding on the top surface to set the offset for the holes, and then picking up one of my layout centres using a wiggler. This will be my zero point, and the second hole location will be dialed in using the DRO usual process of centre drill and pilot before opening out to 23 64 and then reaming 3 8 Well, here are my two bores. They look pretty well centred in that lozenge shape, so I'm fairly happy. And hopefully you can see from where the layout on the bottom here is, if I had machined this first and central to the casting, it would have ended up around 40 thou further up, which would have then shifted these two holes 40 thou in the same direction. I mean, they'd fit and the part would work just fine, it just wouldn't have looked as nice. As yet, nothing on this part is dimensioned, so the next step is to do that, and I will start with the round boss and the bore through the centre. So let's go and do that now. 
I have this held in the vise with the two pins that are through the 3 8 bores firmly resting on the jaws. This way I am referencing all of my dimensions to machine surfaces. I am edge finding one of the 3 8 pins and dialing in the X position with the DRO and then locating the centre punch in the Y direction using a wiggler. Zeroing the DRO then gives me a centre line I can always return to. The first operation is to bring in the height. This is very straightforward with the height being checked with a depth mic as we go. Next up is the outside of the boss and as always my boring head is not quite large enough so I can't use one of my standard boring bars. Instead I have resorted to using the side mounting point with an inappropriately long tool. This tool bit is only 1 8 in diameter and at this extension is very flexible. Looking back I should have made a larger holder to take a quarter inch bit but in reality I subjected my neighbours to 10 minutes of howling until I removed enough material to switch to a more rigid setup. Once I got to this stage though, taking to dimension was straightforward. Moving on to the 5 8 bore through the centre, again centre drill, pilot, drill close to size and then finally ream. And as I haven't bored this, like the book suggests, I am going to have to remember to turn the sleeve that fits in here slightly oversized to achieve the required fit. Finally, this setup is a hole drilled and tapped M4, and this is to lock off the micro attachment when it is not being used. The book suggests using a jig to drill this, but I'm simply going to dial it in using the DRO. The next task is to machine both sides to bring the block to dimension. I have this bolted directly to the mill table through the centre bore, and I am just tapping it into square here using a brass drift. I can then edge find the machine boss at the bottom, and by using the half function on the DRO, I can zero the Y axis on the centre line of the part. Doing it this way means that as long as I machine each side to the same reading, positive and negative, on the DRO, then the lozenge will be centred on that round section. I'm taking this to size using a four flute end mill, taking about 10 thou off each side in turn. Once we are to size, I am switching out to a ball nose end mill to profile the transition there between the circular boss and the flat side. The final machining operation on this block is a tapped hole through the side to take a grub screw. I'm picking up a hole location using a 3 8 pin in the collet here and then simply dialing in the offset using the DRO. The grub screw here is to secure a bearing sleeve, which we will make next over at the lathe. The first feature on this sleeve is the parallel portion that will fit into the cast block. Again, I am marking out with odd leg calipers and then fixing the length of the carriage top. The diameter here needs to be around 5 tenths over 5 eighths to be a snug fit in my reamed hole. Once we are at dimension, a final check of the length and a couple of chamfers completes the work on this side, and I can reverse the part. Now the rest of the features on this must remain concentric, so once I start cutting, this part cannot be removed from the chuck until I'm finished. The first feature is a reduced section that will eventually be threaded 5 8 32, but the important dimension here is the length of the centre section, which is to be 1 thou over 3 quarters, so 0.751. Having marked this oversize with calipers and setting a carriage top, I'm advancing the tool using the top slide, which is set over an angle. This means that it will advance towards the work and towards the chuck. In this way, I can approach the length I need without moving the carriage top. Once I'm within a couple of thou, I can lock the top slide and continue turning my diameter using the usual controls until I reach my 5 8 target. I can then run the carriage up to the stop lock it in place and take the final couple of thou off the length of the centre section, again using the top and cross slides. With that done, I can take the centre section to diameter. This is to be a close fit on the secondary gear, so needs to be within a couple of tenths of three quarters. But other than that, it is a simple piece of turning to dimension. Next up is the threading. The first feature as always is the relief groove, followed by the thread itself. The book calls for 26 TPI, but again for ease, I'm cutting mine at 32. A quick tidy up with a fine file and some emery, and the part can be brought to final length. 
the merest whiff of a break edge on either side of the centre section and a generous chamfer on the end completes the external features. The final operation in this setup is the bore and I'm opening this out close to size using increasing drill bits and then as the concentricity is important I'm using a boring bar to take me to within 10th hour or so of final dimension before reaming to 3 8 And finally a chamfer completes the turning operations. Back to the mill for the last couple of features. First is a clearance notch in the side of the shaft. I don't have the 7 16 cutter the plans call for, but I have managed to find an 11.5mm one, which will do just fine. This is followed by a small flat to take the grub screw, and with those done, let's head over to the bench to see how it all goes together. Here is the sleeve, and it looks pretty good, and you can see how the relief there allows clearance for the bolt hole. I have a nice fit into the cast block, which itself looks okay. I will mask off the machine surfaces and paint the outside of this part off camera. It mounts to the body using another pinned bolt. I didn't film making this as the process is exactly the same as the shorter one from the plunger video. So let's get this assembled. And there it is, and hopefully you can see how this is going to work. The worm shaft will pass through here to engage with the gear, and then the division plates are going to be carried indirectly on here. Well, I think that draws this part to a close. Next time I'll be making a start on the worm shaft itself, so please look out for that if you're interested. Again, do leave any thoughts in the comments. If you do want to see more like this, please do subscribe, and hopefully I'll see you again. Cheerio!